Hey guys, three weeks in a row. Can you believe it? I think it's three. I don't know. I stopped counting. I don't count well. But I wanted to keep bringing you some of the cool stuff I've gotten to do over the last couple of years. And we are still in Giganticon 2022 for this week and next week because got a lot of cool stuff to show you and I'm just so excited to share it with you. But we're going to do something a little bit different this week. Uh, we got the opportunity, myself and Kevin and Midge, got the opportunity to sit down uh, on the main stage at Giganticon and talk about what it's like to be a panel moderator. I've always found that to be fascinating. It's a great conversation. All three of us come from three different backgrounds, three different lengths of time we've been doing these kinds of things. And we just love telling cool stories. I really hope you enjoy this. Feel free to comment on it. Let me know what you think. Uh, we do this every week until we get caught up, and I've got other stuff. The DC Animated Universe stuff is coming. I'm just getting some time together to work on that. But right now, enjoy from Giganticon 2022, myself, Kevin, and Midge, talking about what it's like to moderate panels at Comic-Con. Hello, Giganticon! And uh, we just want to talk to you guys about what it's like behind the scenes. So what we're going to do is tell you some weird stories about being moderators. And if anybody here has questions about that, please ask us. It could be about moderating, it could be about conventions. Um, if we cannot answer you, we'll just stare at you very, very awkwardly. No, we uh, won't. We do that anyway. All the time. Fair, what they said. Well, tell people who you are, sir. My name is Kevin Garcia. Um, I am uh, by trade a high school teacher, uh, but I've been doing conventions for 12, 13 years now, speaking at them. And uh, I'm also, I've also been a journalist for, and a writer for about 20 years, and about 10 of those years at Marvel, which is really fun to keep saying, even though it's not really that big of a deal that what I did there, it's still fun to say I did it. Um, and I've been doing conventions with the people who put on gi Gigant, did I say it right, right? Giganticon? Giganticon. You keep saying gigantic, I'm sorry. No, Gi. Gan it's like gigantic, and it's a convention. Con. Yeah, but gigantic is a, is a legitimate pronunciation of that word. It's a little too bougie, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've if you're going to say that, you got to sit in the chair. Fair enough. Well, I'm going to sit in that. I, that <laughs> chair has been calling me all day. Uh, so I've been working with people who do Giganticon for how long, Mitch? Five years? At least, yeah. Yeah, about five years. And on that note, who are you? Hi, I'm Mitch. Um, I'm the programming director for this one for Fayetteville, where we met. Uh, yes, uh, Greater Austin Comic Con and Hill Country Comic Con. I've worked in live entertainment for 25 years at this point. So uh, everything from stage to variety shows, dance, you name it, I've done it. Um, yeah, I've worked with these guys for about five, six years now. So yeah, it's been a, been a wild ride. I'm kind of on the opposite end of that spectrum. My name is Rob. Uh, Hi, Rob. Hi, Rob. Make, makes you feel better about myself. Uh, I've been going to cons for years, years and years and years and years. I just started actually moderating, being on this side of it, about four months ago. I've been on that side of it for many, many years. And uh, I have I produce two podcasts, and I've been doing that for 12 years. So that's kind of prepared me for this. The only difference is, like, I can hide behind a microphone in my studio, even though we do video. Here, it's full-on interactive. You know, we have a chat room, but it's it, being in the chat online is a lot different than being in front of humans. Very um, true. But it's still fun. I mean, I've, I've been in the entertainment business myself for 30-something years. And I just, I love, I love this part of it. First of all, comfiest chairs ever at a show. These are so nice. Speak for yourself. I don't fit in them. Yeah. You have plenty of room. Yeah, look down. Yeah, but that's cool. We do need to get Let's more mid centric floor. furniture in future events. <sighs> just, just get her a footstool. She'll be fine. But were you guys big convention people before you really got into the other side of it strangely no actually when you said that i was thinking about that i'd only been to like one or two conventions prior to me starting to speak at them um so it's just always been part of my convention experience to be at a microphone uh initially for the first few years i was doing it i was just 
one of the guys that had a smaller panel giving a one-person talk, um, and and then eventually became the person who hosts the, the guests and brings them in for Q and A's and that kind of stuff as well. Um, but pretty much, the vast majority of my of my convention going experience has been on the stage. So I guess that is a bit different. Uh, I had gone to a number of conventions before that, and I worked uh, I worked the Renaissance Festival for a number of years. So that's like a giant interactive convention, you know. Um, yeah, I worked there for a number of years and attended. So it wasn't much of a leap, honestly, to go from that world and educational conventions and things like that uh, to comic cons so it was it was a, a leap that made sense so yeah it's funny we we're each going to kind of ask questions for the group which i think is fun um but uh what made you guys get started what made you say like whatever it is you were doing before you were in entertainment you were doing like renaissance fairs and other other events what made you want to do Comic Con specifically, and be part of that that world behind the scenes. Oh, that's an easy one. That's fish in a barrel answer for me. It's the fans. That's the best part of my job, honestly. One, I get to hang out with my friends all day. My, my we have our con family. My con family. But the the best part of my job is that I only have to worry about your experiences. That's entirely what I do. That is what my my directorship revolves around. That. I have to pay attention to who's fans of what so that I can cater to everybody because everybody's a fan of something and that's okay. And they're very celebratory of, of those fandoms. Like fans can be kind of rabid sometimes and a little bit purist, but here, never a thing. You never have people who are fighting about continuity. You never have people who are arguing about which is right and wrong, nothing like that. They're loving each other's takes on characters. They're meeting new artists. They're finding new fandoms. They're sharing their nerddom. Because when I was younger, being a nerd was really alienating. Like, oh my god, it's a girl who plays Dungeons and Dragons. What? And now I'm not a unicorn anymore, and I love that. But you guys love us. You really love us. Well, and that's and we, we talked about that in a couple of different panels today, how it's a lot easier now to find your tribe. Yes. You know, for us, when we were growing up, D&D &D was either in someone's house or you were in a library. For me, it was the library uh, thing because... Or the hall in front of the art room. Mm -hmm. During lunch, and well, ours was that was in a courtyard for us, yeah. so that was we were way exposed at that point. But getting to a point now that we have this communal thing, you know, that we travel all over the state and sometimes out of state together to do these things. Come and in, and grab a right. seat. Y'all come in and grab a seat. Come on. We're going to be telling cosplay really cons is coming up at five o'clock. Yep. Yeah, and we're telling weird stories about Comic Cons. So if you guys have any weird questions about Comic Cons, we're the people to ask. But yes. having done the other side of it for so long. That transition for me wasn't that bad because I literally started out my first con. I worked because I was part of a group called DFW Fan Force. Before there was the Force.net and everything else, we had a local group, and we worked small shows up in North Dallas. And we had a table, and I would bring my DJ rig, and we would play movie trailers and stuff. And that's how we met back then. You, that's how you met a lot of the the personalities. And I remember. Richard Hatch from, not the Survivor guy, um, Apollo from Battlestar Galactica. <gasps> At this time, this was Circus 2000-ish. He was actually working on his own pilot that was called The Search for Starbuck. He had made a trailer. He was <laughs> pitching it to networks. And he walked up to our table. We had this little TV set up and these horribly oversized speakers because that's what I do. And he's like, can I play my trailer on your system? And I was like, yes, Richard Hatch from Battlestar Galactica. You, I can play your trailer on my system. And it was just, it was that, those kind of moments that were like, I want to do this more because these are the people I want to be around. And that's what got me started too. Because I said earlier that I initially just gave my own talks and then started becoming a host. The reason has to do with what both of you are saying 
and that is supporting people that need supporting and also supporting people that we look up to. Uh, I was at these uh, smaller conventions in uh, South Texas, and they had, and there'd already been some issues between the, the people running it and the, and the guests, but they had Vernon Troyer up there, and you know, Minnie Me from, from Austin Powers, and he was upstage, uh, up on stage in his chair by himself. And he's been in you know, several movies, but he's a shy person. So literally, he's just, anybody have any questions for me? Does anybody? And it was just like, why is he up there by himself? Why doesn't he have somebody with him? So I went to the, um, I went to the, to the managers, and I said, look, from now on, any guests that come in, I'll do the, I'll do the q and I'll, I'll be the host. Just put, don't put them up there by themselves. No kidding. Absolutely. And, and, and don't get me wrong. Some people don't need help. Uh, the, the, what's the... Invader? Anthony Daniels will be in, in yes. Dallas in November. He doesn't need a moderator because he does his own thing. But exactly. that's, that's still a rarity, I think. Yeah. But very I give him the so. option. No, absolutely. What, Mitch? It's very, very much so. Yeah. That's absolutely not. No. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, um, uh, I, I, would, I would go up to people in, uh, beforehand and be like, hey, do you want a moderator? Do you want me to ask questions? Do you want to do this? Do you want me to do that? Uh, and, and some people don't need one. And some people are like, well, I'm used to having my fans do this. And, and I'm like, all right, let's make it work for you. I just didn't want to have that happen again, where I just saw somebody just sitting up there, just all the eyes on him and not knowing what to do. Just because just you're in a movie doesn't mean that you're used to that. Um, I will say that. Again, it's that. I'm on a set with a bunch of cameras versus I'm in a room full of people. It's Sounds. a completely different dynamic. Well, and it's a, it's a different thing. It's a completely different thing. So when I'm sitting here, I'm Mitch. Like, that, this is who it is. I'm not a character. But that was the, the best part of being a character actor because I, I, I classically trained, which, you know, me and William Shatner. You for what that matters. You are a moderator. <laughs> um... I hate that. It's it's one of those like theater kid brrr, where they're like, I'm a classically changed Shakespearean Shakespearean actor. Cool. Uh, so is so is, yeah, yeah. For me, it's a little different because I'm also a musician. I'm a DJ. I host karaoke. If you were at the pre-party last night, I apologize. Um, Don't apologize. Don't apologize. You have the voice of an angel. You do. I have, and the perfect face for radio. Also, but my goal is that I'm the same dude here that I am there. Now, this dude is turned up to 11 because he has to be. It's what I call my Bruce Wayne side and my Batman side, which then feeds my Batman obsession. Do you find that when people meet you off the lights? Because what I found a lot when I was doing DJ shows and karaoke shows and hosting shows and things of that nature, people would walk up and go, dude, are, are you okay? Like, yeah. Cool. Like, nobody can be that guy 24-7. It's just not oh. possible. Oh. But I've, do you, I've, I've but met do you some people that? that try. I've met some people that try, and I honestly feel a little bit bad on the inside. You can't be on all the time. No. Sometimes, Sometimes I just want to have dinner with my wife. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, so I, uh, I have debilitating social anxiety. Like, right with you. to be perfectly honest, I, I am not good at crowds. But I have worked in, this in, in these industries for so long that it has become a very well choreographed dance. I look like I'm being social. I look like I'm doing those things. My favorite way to make, meet people is when they just start talking, because I'm story obsessed. So you want to meet me? Tell me about your day. I'm that person that wants to know. I want to know, what did you do? What do you like? What's going on? I, I won't talk about me very much. That's, that's, that's not, for me, that's not interesting. I, I will pick fun at myself. I already know those stories. Yeah, I, I already know this shit. It's fine. <laughs> um, I often say I look like I lost a fight with a stapler and a packet of Kool-Aid because I have all the piercings and the hair changes color every other week. So, Did you lose that fight I'm, or did you win that fight? I don't know. We're still trying to tally up the points. Um, but I find that if I'm in my performer persona as Sasha, then I'm meeting people as Sasha because that's that's who they want to meet. That's the, and that's in that industry. That's part of it is that afterwards you're expected to interact with audiences and things like that. When it's Work me, yes, you gotta get a gimmick. Um, 
but if it's me, it's a little bit more awkward because I don't know how to take compliments and I, it's it's very strange for me. So it's easier when I'm on to meet people. If I'm in a room where I don't know anybody, it's a, I'm very I, I will hide in a corner. Oh yeah. I'm not good at breaking the ice. It always helps to have a person with you and be like, I need a wingman. Oh, You're absolutely there we go. right. Uh, I, I'm, I'm the same way a lot, where I will have an on persona and an off persona. They're not extremely different, with the exception of the fact that I think my on persona is a little bit more, um, a little bit more restrained and controlled. I, I, I teach, I speak on stage, I do video interviews. I don't cuss in any of those. I do podcasts now. I don't cuss. Uh, in my personal life, I will, you know, be very filthy. I was scandalized the first time I heard him say the F word. Yeah, because <laughs> she'd known me for a while before we, we hung out outside of work, and, and, and she's like, wait, he cusses? It's, it's very <laughs> weird. Off mic, absolutely, like a sailor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I use a, it as punctuation. There's a, there's, a, there's a switch that flips when I have a mic in my hand. Were any of or you if I'm on my podcast, I agree. Were any of you in here for the uh, um, Casper Van Dien and Jake Busey panel? I loved that those two kept saying earmuffs. They would not tell the scandalous stories because there were so many kids in here, and they're both going that's through. That's what that's through. about. Yes. Moose, Moose our other earlier. moderator, crushed that, by the way. <laughs> Moose yeah. is actually working another panel right now where he would be here with us. Yes. Uh, I heard but earmuffs over and over again. I was like, what's that Right, about? because they were they're up here, and I'm, I'm back there watching them, and I'm like, they're – they're like, one, two, three, four, five. Nope, nope, we've hit our earmuff quota. We're, we're going to not tell that story to this audience. It was the cutest thing I've ever seen. Uh, that being said, I love collecting stories yeah. from things that have happened. Because um, one thing is I've never really had, I, I don't really fanboy out when meeting celebrities, which helps for doing this job. I, you know, I used to be a reporter, and I would interview people all the time. And so when I went from that to doing this on stage, it was just not much transition for me. Um, but that being said, I could still collect some fun stories. So, for example, I got attacked by Jason and lived. He threw a sharp object at me, and I'm still alive. Um, Princess Zelda tried to steal my Master Sword. That happened. Uh, what else? Um, I, I uh, aided River Song when she was not feeling well, so that was interesting, too. So I got these stories, and I don't mind going into detail on them, but it's really fun to say the little bits like that because it sounds more exciting than it actually was. The, the Jason one, for example, um, one thing I do before every panel is I'll go to somebody and ask, how would you like me to, to present you? Do you want me to reference anything that's coming up? Uh, I want to make sure I'm saying your name correctly. Well, that particular question annoyed the actor who plays Jason. And he says, this is a normal name. How could you not say it? And I was like, okay. And he still didn't answer that question, so okay. Um, and I figured pretty well he didn't need a moderator. Sure enough, he didn't. So I just had the microphone going around to the audience to get the questions. And, and he's like, and some people can't say normal names. And he took a pencil and threw it at me. So I've been attacked by Jason and lived. You know? right. With a sh uh, the sharp with, object. With a sharp yeah. object, yes. Uh, and for Princess Zelda, um, she was giving uh, the, vo the, the English voice actor was talking, and uh, somebody had a little necklace that was a Zelda theme, and I go, oh, I have one too, and I pulled out a little master sword that comes out of a sheath. And she goes, oh, that's so cool, can I see it? And I handed it to her, and she goes, ah, I feel like I have power now. And then she put it in her pocket, and we kept talking. <laughs> and then as we walk off stage, I go, hey, excuse me, can I? And she goes, oh, you want a selfie? Sure. Took a selfie together. Cool. Can I have the sword back? Oh, do I still have it? Okay, here you go. And the thing is, I found out later it was her birthday, and I felt really bad about it. I was like, oh, I would have let her keep the sword if I knew that. So then I did another panel with her like, a little bit later, and I'm like, late birthday present, and I gave her a brand new unopened Master Sword because I just was like, you know, why not? Well, and that's also part of the things that I like just as much as doing this is walk in the vendor hall because the vendors are also part of our con family too because you see I a lot of the vendors. I just bought so many things right now. Yeah, it's – I have to leave my debit card in the hotel room. I kind of don't have a choice. Rents do. But getting to see the people that bring their wares to shows, and I see people here that I see in Dallas, which I think is awesome too, that they're willing. You know, if you saw the Jurassic Park Jeep out front, because why wouldn't you? It's right by the front door. The couple that runs that are two of my very closest friends and that I didn't meet through cons. I actually met through church 12 years ago. Um, and I didn't know they were going to be here till like last night, which was kind of neat. The, they're part of our family too, because we're the ones that are like, "Hey, what's new? Show me what's going on." And the artists and the cosplayers who 
I love that we have that cosplay has gotten to the point that it has because I'm fascinated by cosplay. It's not something I can do, much less well. But when they talk about how they do these things and how they construct them and how they, when it's like, yeah, I like this was two blocks of whatever a month ago and now it's full body armor. Those kind of things fascinate me just as much as seeing you guys. Like I know when I get the call, hey, Rob, we're doing a show. We want you to come be a part of this. Like that to me is enough of an honor. Like that to me, like it brings me more joy than you guys understand. But then when we get to the point, for those of you that don't know the way we do this, we have the guest list. We have a meeting, usually takes an hour or two. And we go through the entire show together. And we find out, and it's a very collaborative process. I mean, at the, at the crux of it all, Midge has the gavel. But she rarely ever has to use it because we all work together so well. It's like, all right, here's your marquee guests. And we just distribute them amongst us. And I don't, I mean, granted, you guys have been doing this part of it a lot longer than I have, but I haven't had a point where I was just like, okay. Like every time I've gotten an assignment, I'm like, let's go with the word in the middle. Um, earmuffs. Earmuffs. Yeah. Yes. But that collaborative process, I don't think people, a lot of people understand. And much less once we do get it set, we get here the day of, and being an AV geek, I was the kid in the third grade that pushed the projector into your class and made your day because you weren't going to have to do I work. I was that kid in high school. Yeah. I sat behind I the worked, football team. I, I worked at the movie theater in high school, and I worked in the projection booth. The cats back there in the corner, and the man in these cameras, they don't get nearly the credit they deserve because, number one, it's very, very hard work. Yes. The setup alone. But to execute and make things look as good as they do each and every time without fail is one of the things that I think makes a convention. It can make or break a convention. Yes, absolutely. Because it's rather difficult to have a convention when everybody's having to talk like this and not everybody learned how to speak from the diaphragm. Because some people are really, really soft and they don't Those are those moments that are loud. like, don't you carry one of these for a living and I don't yeah, understand. Just, just do this forever. <laughs> I, I, I'm too quiet, right, usually? Uh, <laughs> All right. To, to backtrack for a second, you mentioned the collaborative process. For me and anything that I do, that matters. Um, I've, I've been a global director in an IT department. I've done all of those things. And I learned a long time ago that you will get something better out of your people if you give them ownership of it. If you say, this is ours, as opposed to, okay, this is my little piece of the puzzle, and we're going to do it my way. No, that's, that's not as much fun. Um, and these guys are going to shows more often than I am, as I work in other industries. So I trust the people that I work with to know what some of these people are like, you know, and they'll, they'll say, they're like, well, oh, I've done this panel before, you know, you should really try it out. And they want to share those experiences with each other. Um, and that to me is, is a big part of the process. I, I don't like building the schedule by myself. I, I don't, I can, but I don't want to because I want them to have a chance to go to the vendor hall, get food, because a lot of us on staff are running 24-7. Honestly, <laughs> I wish more conventions ran them the way you do. I know you don't run the whole convention, but I mean, this, this part of it, because it, I, I'll go to another convention, I'll be like, hey, so can we get involved in a discussion of it? No, we'll let you know. And it's fine, often, but like the idea of, of being involved, it lets us go for the things we want, or like you were saying, share those experiences. I, I I've done voice actor panels a lot. I love working with voice actors. They're a lot of fun. But whenever there's somebody who's like a new moderator, I'm like, do the voice actor panel. Just do that. I know I know you usually do the anime panels. You do the anime panel this time. Because one, the voice actors already know how to be in front of a mic, so it's fine. And, and most two, of them spend a lot of time together going to shows exactly. together too. 
And, and the next, the fans love it, and you're going to have a blast. So it's mm -hmm. a great thing for a new moderator to do. And uh. it's that mind frame of every show is somebody's first show. Yes. Yeah. You know, but you talked about working live events. One thing you learn in bands is, yes, I'm going to play the same song every, every day, day on a tour for six months. But every time I'm on this stage and I do that song, it's somebody's first time hearing it. And whether it's the first time I've dealt with this person or the 75th, it's somebody else's first. And if we're not showing that energy, we can't give them that energy. Exactly. Uh, I don't care if I'm speaking to a room of two people or if I'm playing <coughs> or if I'm performing at a sold out, beautiful, centennial years old theater in Albuquerque, New Mexico, because your friend is a producer and lied to you about how many seats are in the venue because she knows you get stage fright even after 20 years. Allegedly. Allegedly. Okay. This is all theoretical. I'm not pulling from personal experience or anything. I mean, that's all. Everything we've said here is theoretical. Nothing we've no, said here is No, no, no. Confirmation and denials. I was not actually attacked by Jason. Wink, wink. Um, we're having to time check ourselves because normally someone is back there with a clock saying you have five minutes. I think we need to put a clock on the back and, wall. And, and that someone Adobe. is often Midge. Mm -hmm. Often me. And, and that's something else that happens. I, I think especially when you're starting out, sometimes you get too excited and you maybe run too fast mm -hmm. or, or you may want to ask more questions or you just feel bad when there's like a line of people who want to ask questions and you're like, oh, maybe we got time for one more. Maybe we got time for another. Maybe we got time for another one. And, and that's how you run over time. I, I will say one of the worst experiences I had as a moderator was with Kevin Grievous, who I'll be moderating tomorrow. Because it was one of my first That's times. That's one way to plug it. There you go. <laughs> because shameless, shameless self-promotion. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was there. Um, uh, but the thing is, is that I knew him before uh, the, the event, and he was kind of a friend of mine, and I was so excited for it that was. I got. Yes, exactly. No, I got overly excited, and this was one of my first times moderating, and I just wanted everything to be perfect, and I just started overthinking everything to the point that I wear glasses most of the time, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to contacts just for this one thing. So I hadn't worn contacts in like two years, and I just put them on that morning. So my eyes were blood red and watery because I just hadn't got used to it. And, uh, and then I also decided I want to have a projector up to show some of his comics and everything, and I had, it, it was just... One thing after another was like, why am I overthinking it? And it was because it was a friend of mine, and I wanted to do good for him. And it's like, now I'm like, don't overthink it. I have a list of things. Oh, that's another thing. Um, since uh, you, you guys have moderate, I think I moderate more than you guys do. One of the things that I've done is, is I'll have a list of possible questions or topics, but I expect things to just kind of go their own way. See, I prepare, what do you guys do? I prepare differently. If you, if you looked at my references here, you would be like, what is this dude? Because I've with the podcast and I've worked, we've worked a lot of film festivals and things like that. I have certain standby questions I like to go to, but with my notes, what I'm looking at is the deep cuts I want to hit or the, the stuff that I would read online and go, is that a thing? You know, like we were talking about in the last panel where I was talking to Brian Prince and I was like, it says you're the tallest parkour athlete in the world. Is that like, is that true? He's like, yeah, I'm 6'10". And, you know, so I don't necessarily write questions out. I know kind of, I, I like to say I'm just, I'm the traffic cop up here. Mm -hmm. My goal is to find the questions they don't get asked enough. And an example is I interviewed the, the man who was the voice of Fievel in An American Tale recently. And he, amazing human, by the way amazing human he was the last panel of the day and we talked about american tale and how he got the job and his work with spielberg and i was like i got a couple other things he's like yeah go and i said the first thing is i'm a huge fan of tiny tune adventures and you did that show he's like yeah well, steven spielberg you know he kind of uses likes to use the same people tom hanks but i go but i got another one and he looks at me he's okay and i go you were in Bebe's Kids. <laughs> and his what was that? eyes got this Bebe's big around. Kids. Oh, yes. It was an animated feature in the early 90s based on the comedy of Robin Harris that had Tone Loke playing a toddler. And it's wonderful. It is a wonderful animated film. I loved it. And his eyes got, he's like, 
Nobody ever wants to talk about that movie. I'm like, no, we're talking about that movie. Because well, I have a microphone and you can't stop me. Wait, I want to jump in for just a quick second. I, a couple conventions back this past summer, I had two artists up here that do two different types of art. And the topic of Baby's Kids came up. And one of the guys goes, oh, yeah, I was a character designer for that. The other guy goes, I did stills for that. And I'm like, they both <laughs> happen to work on Baby's Kids. Are, those are such cool <laughs> moments when, like, when you find that common ground that you didn't even know existed. Because you could do all the research in the world. And I don't think it was never on either of their everything. IMDb's. I don't think it was on either of their IMDb's, but they both worked on Baby's Kids, and they were so excited. They didn't know each other then, but they just, you know, it was and just that's like, cool. You know, and I've, you know, like, I might have a couple of tricks up my sleeve for Last Starfighter tomorrow. You don't know. But it's just those moments. And then you run into them at, at a show later on, and you just stop by, and they're like, oh, no, you're here. <laughs> and you just start laughing. Like, you know, I had a poll. I had a uh, a panel recently with Tiffany Vollmer and Stephanie and Adana, who will be up here tomorrow. Absolute amazing humans. And I, I gave I gave Moose a little thing to use, and I hope he uses it because I just want to see what happens. But when you run into those same people at other cons, and you just want to walk up and say hello, and they're just like, "Oh wow, you're here!" Like there's something about that that just brings me an immense amount of joy because now they're part of your con family too. On, th on that note, how much research do you guys do for for um, upcoming panels? And I, and I say this knowing full well that Midge does research for other people's panels, but I wanted to bring that up as a question. How much research do you think people should do if they're going to be moderating a panel? It's going to depend on the nature of the panel for me. And maybe it's just because I'm new to the game. And you talked about the first panel you ever did. I had the exact opposite. Because the first panel I ever moderated for back in May, I had two hours to prepare. Because the, the, the guy that ran the con, who's a friend of mine, was like, dude, all of my moderators have bailed on me. I got four panels today. Can you help me out? And I was like, I've, been there. I've, I've never done this part of it, but you know, it can't be that much different than what I've been doing for years. So only having those two hours to prepare, it didn't give me the anxiety. I didn't have time to be anxious, right? So I was like, you know, to heck with it. And the first one was, and it was very, uh, very strangely paired. It was voice actors. But it was a guy that had done one Pokemon character in one of the movies and the guy that was the voice of Andy in Toy Story. <laughs> so, so equivalent. So the way I normally prepare, I don't, I, I usually will do it the week of. So it's still fresh in my brain. Was that Goaty that was on that panel? I believe so. Yeah, he's very nice. Yeah, and they were great. But having to find that common ground, that, but getting them to talk to each other was the thing. And that was easy to do because they had animation and they could talk about it. But like for tomorrow, for Last Starfighter, I own the anniversary Blu-ray, which I have dissected before. But it had been, it's been two or three years since I, you know, I did it during the pandemic because Lord knows we had nothing else to do. No. I was watching all of the MCU movies, all of the Star Trek movies, all of the James Bond movies. But I dissected that Blu-ray this week again with the commentaries, with the featurettes, because I, I try to be as prepared as I can. And it's the, the philosophy that Disney uses. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a huge Disney head. I grew up in South Florida. Walt Disney World was a yearly pilgrimage for us. So I go deep into the Disney culture. And when you are cast as a, as a human character, Ariel, Cinderella, Prince Charming, your part of your training is you have to know that character inside and out, and you're required to watch the films X number of times because when that kid walks up to you at the park and asks about a character, you better know who that character is. So for something like that, I am going to go through and I'm going to dissect as much as I can. And so I can get to that panel and be armed and say, you know what? And because I've already got the opener for tomorrow because I found out something about that film that the way it was originally written, if it had gone that way, it would have been a completely different film. And I'm fascinated by, by what you know, what Mr. Guest and Ms. Stewart have to say about that. But at the same time, I always, I am very time conscious. I have, I have a modicum of OCD. Like if you come to my house, all of my 
movies are in alphabetical order. When you're married to an art major, that's a problem because my wife does not believe in symmetry where symmetry is very big with me. So we have to have an arrangement where this room, I get to put the stuff up and you do not get to touch the stuff. In this room, you can put the stuff up and I will deal with that. But that part of my OCD makes me time conscious. But also I did a lot of stage managing for cons too. And I wanna make sure that I'm being respectful of the time, not only to the people on the stage, but the people that are coming up next. So you'll see me a lot, and this is, this, is a, this is a Rob trick. You'll see me sit like this a lot because I can see my watch and not make it look like I'm looking at my watch. Whereas I have to like wake up my phone to look at my clock. Oh yeah, uh, yeah I'm looking yeah. at my phone on stage, I know. And so th that's part of it too, but as far as go doing the research, it, it's gonna depend on the guest. But I usually will do it the week of, just so it's still fresh for me. So I put together cheat sheets for everybody. That you do. For other yes. moderators, which I think is amazing. Um, I will start it off for everybody. Um, and that's getting them the bare bones links that they would need. So they'll start off with, well, I don't know who this person is. Here, here's uh, three to four links that you could start with. You can pull a bunch of questions out of that fall down a rabbit hole if you want to. But when I'm moderating, uh, I'm crowd focused. So I have a bucket of questions that I keep off to the side. Um, just in case. Just in case. And I will use those at the beginning to sort of kick things off. Uh, I do look for those deep cuts. But <coughs> um, I let questions that the audience is asking lead me more than most things. I will absolutely pay attention and piggyback off of what everybody else is, is talking about um, and take that a little bit further. Because I did that in Fayetteville quite a bit. It was, it was, they gave me the horror panels. Uh, ha, 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 ha. For those of you that don't know about Fayetteville, that was the big theme of that particular show was Twin Peaks yep. and the anniversary. And a chunk, and I mean a, a chunk, chunk of the cast was there. And this was two weeks before the world shut down. Yep. Fayetteville was literally the last show before we went into lockdown. Yep. And, and for those of you who don't know about Midge, everything horror is important and yep. good. Yep. Yes. All of it. I'm a giant horror nerd. That is my fandom and a half. Oh, my God. I've seen all the bad ones. I've seen all the good ones. I love them all. Um... And even that is it like, I, I've floored some people when I tell them that the horror community is family friendly. They don't understand. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like I, I was that kid who was sitting in my older, one of my older sister's laps watching Freddy Krueger movies, laughing my see, ass I'm, off. I'm the opposite. I, I have a policy. I live by a code. I refuse to pay someone to try to make me pee on myself. <laughs> I don't do horror movies. I don't do haunted houses. But I do like films like Ready or Not, You're mm -hmm. Next, I thought were both amazing. There's something I saw earlier this year that people were like, you saw that? And I was like, yeah, and I liked it. There's some, some artsy ones. I, I, mean, I, I view horror like the way I would, I would view fantasy or sci-fi. I'm just fascinated by it, and I just find it exciting. I don't find it scary, but it's just fun. If he's doing panels that have anything horror-oriented, he'll call me and be like, I yep. don't know this thing. You're like, give me, give me something I should look up on this guy. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite go-to question you use universally? I don't think universally, but I think the one topic that I try to do a lot is I, I know the fans are going to ask about the topics, right? They're not going to they're going to ask if it's Dragon Ball. They're going to ask about how do you think about this character versus that character, or how do you get into this character? So then I tend to focus most of my questions about behind the scenes stuff because I know I don't want to step on the fans' toes. The fans want to ask those fan questions. So then I go Absolutely. for those behind the scenes things. Uh, so for example, uh, tomorrow I have uh, Noah Hathaway, and I, everybody knows. Um, the uh, ever never ending story, but I'm like, I want to see his other stuff again. I went back and watched Troll again, which is kind of a horror comedy ish movie. Um, and it was an attempt at an actual horror movie, but it was, it, but it's good though, it's fun, way better than it should be. Isn't and Troll yeah. 2 the one that they yes. did the documentary yes. on? Yes. Troll 2 is the one everybody Troll, makes fun of. Troll 2 is the one that everyone makes fun of, and it, it is not related nearly at all to the first movie. And the, the famous thing from that is. The, the kid in the glasses is standing on the this, oh, this yeah. overhang thing, and he sees him, and they've turned the guy to green goo, which looks just like chlorophyll. 
and it's the most poorly acted series of words in the entire world. Do the line. Oh, fuck. Oh, they're eating him. And then they're going to eat me. Oh, my God. <laughs> Dogs' heads are exploding outside. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. the way it goes. That 100%, that is it. And, like, you have to count the beats, too, because it's like, they're da-da-da. Sometimes cue cards get stuck together. Sometimes. It happens. Sometimes. Uh, and and then, uh, but it comes to I don't want to go too deep into it. I've heard some moderators and stuff like I want to I want to surprise them with a question. It's like, well, they're they're the guest, so I don't want to surprise them too much. I want to surprise them with nice surprises. Yeah, the, um, the surprises in the best possible exactly. way. Like that's why the deep cuts are cool. Exactly. Yeah. That, that those kind of deep cuts. Because if they did it on a commentary track, they're not ashamed to talk about it. Right. So no. It's there. That um, is that is free. That is that is free. But it, but occasionally I have gotten panels where I'd have to either I don't I know nothing about the topic. Anything athletics. I've, I've had to host a few sports panels. I'm like, all right, I'm going to spend the entire night reviewing everything they've ever done. I, I learned that pro wrestling is a lot, this is going to sound silly, a lot more violent than I thought it was, but that's not what I thought. That's not the way I mean. I mean what I mean by that is the good guys are mean. They're like bullies. And I'm like, what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that panel this morning was amazing. That, that was, was that, really that was an was adrenaline great. rush this morning. I love talking to Charlie Haas. There was one panel that I almost had that I freaked out about. Um, I was at a convention that that was it, it fell apart that year and it never happened again. And the Sons of Anarchy wanted to get into a fist fight with the people promoting the, the convention. Oh dear! And uh, they didn't know where the uh, moderator for that panel was, so they said, "Hey, Garcia, you're you're going to moderate this panel. It starts in ten minutes." I don't watch that show. Like I, I've worked with Ron Perlman before, but he's not going to remember, uh, you know. So I'm like very quickly everything I can find about the Sons of Anarchy. I'm like I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is going to be crazy, and I already know there's some issues behind the scenes. And then finally they're like, "Oh, his moderator, sir. Thank you." And I just walk away. I'm like I am DV trivia. Yes, that's exactly where I was going through. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to be part of this panel. Not going to be part of this panel. It's a gift. I am DV trivia is a gift. Um, that being said, you got to be careful though, because sometimes a lot of those crowd sourced sites have weird stuff in it, so I usually try to see if I can find it in more than one place, you know, hopefully. That's why I give you more than one link. Oh, and social medias, to jump back to that yes, one. Yes, if it's their own social media, I can definitely Absolutely. That's theirs. Absolutely. That, uh, and that can sometimes be more important than IMDb, is having mm -hmm. your guest's Twitter feed, their personal website, but you want something where they're having a conversation uh, I will also send them links to interviews that these guests have done previously because, again, you want to see what they're talking about, how they comport themselves, what's this person like, things like that. Um, so I, I give that starter pack just to take a little bit of that heat off because you have some people who don't like to, they don't, they don't like to research their people. They just, they like to just run in and do it live. Um, and then you have people like Kevin that I've worked with who will research them to death. May, it may never, may never even come up because I may be a guest that just speaks the entire time or audiences ask so many questions, but I do the research. Hey, before we uh, keep talking, because we're about to wrap up again uh, in a bit, at the beginning I said if anybody has questions, just pop up a hand, but, but we've been talking for a bit. Anybody have a question about moderating or something that, that you've seen? You're like, hey, why does this happen? Or or what should I do here? Or could I be a moderator? Any of those questions? We'll take it. Cool. Yes, sir. So would, uh, would you consider that moderating in 2023 is easier than moderating in 1986? From a research standpoint, heck yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, oh, yeah, research standpoint, but also convention standpoint. Con conventions evolved uh, from, the, from the early 2000s to today. They became much more celebrity focused, much more fan focused. Whereas before that, they were much more um, genre or event focused. So if it's a Comic Con, it's just American comics. If it's a Trek convention, it's just Trek. And then over time, it kind of merged. So you go to an anime convention now, and there will be American comics artists, and there'll be an author, and there'll be an actor from a movie, and it's in even though it's an anime convention. So, so yes, the research has gotten way easier, but the convention itself is just an entirely different beast. And I was 13 back then. I don't know if I'd have been Which able to really does make my job challenging, because now I'm like trying to plug the holes of a bursting nerd ship. <laughs> what is, I, 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 want, I want the last question. I'm going to claim it. Oh. What is the panel 
what's your great white whale right now outside of the obvious? Like, I would love to do a panel with Kevin Smith, but I kind of wouldn't have to be there. Yeah. Because I, I would I'm say, hello, Mr. Smith, huge fan, and then he would talk <laughs> for an hour and a half because that's what he does, and I'm okay with it because I would be there. But do you have something that's off the beaten path that's a panel that you would want? I definitely do, but Midge looks like she's ready. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Robert Rodriguez, all right? Uh, he did the mariachi movies and Spy Kids movies and all those movies. Um, and he lives in Austin. I live in Austin. He's from South Texas. I'm from South Texas. He has uh, a cool house. He has a cool house. He does all of his movies on his property. Um, I was a reporter 20 years ago, and I was interviewing actors and directors and whatever, and I'm like, I need to get a hold of Robert Rodriguez. So I started researching and trying to find. He does not have his contacts online, so I started finding, well, I found this person, found this person. Eventually, I got a hold of his sister. And she goes, yeah, I'll, ca I'll, I'll hook you up with Bob. I mean, just give Bob a call, and I'll have him call you right back. About an hour goes by. I'm sorry, my brother is not available. And I'm like, all right, fine. Uh, and then years later, um, I, there was a chance to track to him at for a panel, and the panel ended up getting canceled. And then years later, uh, he, he premiered a show at South By, and he then took questions from the audience. He took five questions. I was question number six. So I have oh. never been able to ask him a question. <laughs> so you've so always been Rodriguez adjacent. Yes, I've always <laughs> been. Uh, yeah, I'm like I'm five feet away from him. I still couldn't ask him a question. And it's not that I need to get anything out of him. It's not that I'm a massive fan. It's just that I've been trying for 20 years <laughs> and it hasn't happened yet. So he's my white whale. Beth's in the corner. She's giving us the wrap it up signal. She is. She is. Go. Uh, I get to put my white whales on stage and make you guys do it for me. So Ooh. that's really an unfair question. Like I made him do a Saturday morning cartoons one. Nice. That went over really well. And there it was a voice, a couple of voice actors and then a couple of, of artists. And they said, well, I was talking to Marty, uh, the voice of Courage the Cowardly Dog. And he was like, why the hell were we all on this panel? And I went, because I'm selfish and I wanted my childhood on a panel. <laughs> but... Uh, outside of that, sheer unadulterated power. Oh God, years. yes, it's great. It's the best power trip ever. I'm like, mm, yes, let's do this. Go. Uh, but outside of that, uh, I have a bucket list that carries over between genres. I have said for eons that I desperately want to crew for Henry Rollins more than the Law House. Like I, I do. I don't want to perform with Henry Rollins. I want to I want to crew for Henry Roll. I want to stage manage that show. Hell, I would run a light board for that show. I don't care. And I won't then, do sound. And then no. hang out with Henry Rollins afterwards. I mean, it's fine, but I would want to do a panel with Henry Rollins because I adore him. I, mean, I I was an angry Black Flag fan, so you know, hey. For my birthday this year, I bought myself the 35th anniversary Blu-ray of Streets of Fire, and I have been obsessed with that movie ever since. I loved it when I was a kid. I love it more now. I want Michael Pere. Now, if I could get Defoe and I could get her, that would be awesome. But I want to do a Streets of Fire panel, and I don't know why. Because <laughs> there's like, so much about that movie I need to it's know. It's a panel for you. Yes. Yes. That's cool. All right, so we're going to take a break. Coming up at the top of the hour, today will be the adult cosplay contest. Kids cosplay is tomorrow. Tomorrow. We're going to have our judges are probably on the way. They're working on the pre-judging now. Mm -hmm. Beth does not have to throw something heavy at me because I'm mm -hmm. wrapping up the panel. We're going to take a break. Stick around. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you. Just in general because this has been a great show. we got a whole other day tomorrow. We do. It's All right. Be fun. We'll be back in a minute. Yeah.